morning. Good morning. And welcome again to this gathering of the Kennesaw uh, First Presbyterian Fellowship. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank you all for making it. It was a long and arduous week. <laughs> I know if uh, any of you had a week like I did, your faith was tested. So I'd like to uh, we appreciate you coming out and enjoying the day. Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear O Zion. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. The historical Jesus. Christianity, more than really any other world religion, is based on the belief that a certain person existed at a certain period of time and a certain series of events happened regarding that person in that period, in that time. If you look at Buddhism, well, to a large extent, Buddha was a philosopher. And so if somehow it was discovered someday that Buddha never really existed, that it was actually a PR agent that wrote all the stuff or something. It probably wouldn't affect Buddhists all that much because their religion is not based on Buddha having done a certain set of things other than writing uh, the writings that he wrote. Same with Confucius. Uh, but Christianity is all about Jesus Christ, God incarnate, being crucified for our sins and resurrected from the dead. And Paul himself, in, uh, in uh, the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So if if Christ didn't exist, what, what would that mean Christianity? It would mean there is no Christianity. Now, yes, I understand there are certain Christians that believe that what matters about the Bible is that it's a guide for everyday living, and it wouldn't bother them too much uh, if, if it was discovered Jesus didn't exist. But if you're kind of in the evangelical background, uh, well, if it was proven that Jesus didn't exist, you wouldn't have a religion anymore. Paul goes on to say, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. So today we will look at what we might call the documentary evidence or the textual evidence. Uh, we can also someday talk about the archaeological evidence. Uh, the Israeli Antiquities Authority spent three years trying to prove that the ossuary of James the Just, Jesus' brother, was a fake. And finally the judge had to take the prosecutor aside and say, you have no case. And they dropped it. Which means that bone box they found that says uh, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus, is probably uh, real. So it's an archaeological object that actually ties Jesus to first century uh, AD uh, Israel. But we're not going to talk about the archaeological evidence today. We're going to talk about the textual uh, evidence. So we will start out with using the Bible. Now, in the 19th century, late 19th century, when people first started questioning, you know, did Jesus really exist? They sometimes, their next sentence would be, you know we can't use the Bible as a source. Well, that would be equivalent to saying, if we're going to discuss whether or not Julius Caesar existed, we can't use his uh, commentaries on the Gallic Wars, you know, the ones that start out all Gaul is, uh, is separated into three parts. Well, we can't use that. We're going to throw that out. Now we'll start talking whether Julius Caesar is. Uh, same thing we had talked about St. Hilda of Whitby uh, in our Sunday school earlier. Well, same thing. 
if you're going to talk about whether she actually exists or not, if your starting point is, we're going to throw out everything that the Venerable Baby said about her in his ecclesiastical history, we'll start there as to whether he existed or, or she existed or not. Well, it's kind of the same thing here. How can you throw out the Bible? I can just announce that the Bible is irrelevant. And I don't think you can. So we'll start with the Bible. And now the Bible was not written as a history. There's only one book in the Bible that we could really call a history, and that's the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles tells us a lot about whether the early church existed or not. It doesn't tell us a whole lot about whether Jesus existed. So we have to look mostly to the Gospels for that. Now the Gospels, Gospel stands for good news. The Gospels were not written to be mini biographies. They were written to be uh, inspirational, to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. But that being said, it doesn't mean there are no uh, autobiographical, there are no biographical details in them. There's actually a whole lot, and I'm going to give you some of them now. His mother's name was Mary. She was betrothed to Joseph, a carpenter. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, not by Joseph. Before Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem to participate in the census called by the Emperor Augustus. Jesus was born in Bethlehem during the reign of Herod the Great. Herod the Great died in 4 BC, so that means Jesus was born in 4 BC or earlier. Thus our calendar is at least four years old. Jesus was descended from King David in the house of Judah. He may have been considered the legitimate king of the Jews by some because he was a direct descendant from Herod theory of Jesus was a legitimate heir to uh, David's dynasty. Ordered all boys two years and younger in and around Bethlehem to be slain. Mary and Joseph took Jesus to safety in Egypt until the death of Herod. Several prophets identified the baby Jesus as the Jewish Messiah or the anointed one that uh, Ed talked about a moment ago in, in Psalms 2. Jesus grew up in Nazareth in Galilee, what today would be born in Israel or in Palestine. Jesus had a, a bunch of brothers named James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And he had some sisters too, but unfortunately we never hear what their names are. Now, uh, depending on whether they're Catholic or Protestant, you know, are these brothers, are they half brothers, are they first cousins on your uncle Elmo's side? We're not going to get in that. But the scriptures tell us that Jesus had brothers. Uh, Jesus was a carpenter by trade, and we're only told about that in Mark. Jesus began his ministry at about 30 years of age after he was baptized in the Jordan River by his relative, John the Baptist. Jesus spent 40 days in the desert to prepare for his mission. He successfully resisted temptation by the devil. Jesus made Capernaum and Galilee the headquarters of his ministry. Jesus primarily ministered to the Jews, but he also had Samaritan and Roman followers. Uh, we're a little over halfway through. I hope you're getting the idea that there's a whole lot of biographical detail about Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus had 12 close followers. He referred to them as apostles. He had many other followers, attracting crowds at least as large as 5,000 in some cases. Some of his most uh, loyal followers were women, including Mary Magdalene. At some point in his ministry, Jesus proclaimed himself the Son of God. Depends whether you're looking at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where he doesn't do it until the very end of his ministry, or if you're reading the Gospel of John, where he does it on the third word of the second chapter, roughly the third word. Uh, Jesus performed 36 recorded miracles, uh, and he provided food to 5,000 people for five loaves of bread and two fish. He preached a message of redemption from sin, salvation by faith in God and His Son, and proclaimed that the kingdom of God was not. He performed numerous exorcisms driving out demons. He was betrayed by one of his twelve followers, Judas Iscariot, during a visit to Jerusalem for the Passover. Jesus was tried before members of the Jewish Sanhedrin and accused of blasphemy for proclaiming himself the Messiah in the Old Testament and the Son of God. Because the Jews had no law to put a man to death, they brought Jesus before the Roman governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. Pilate deferred the case to Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee. Herod Antipas returned Jesus to Pilate. Pilate offered the crowd in Jerusalem to release Jesus, but they demanded his crucifixion. Jesus was tortured by Roman soldiers. Jesus was crucified on a hill called Golgotha, or Calvary. And when he died, a great darkness appeared over Jerusalem, and some miracles occurred. And Jesus died and 
was resurrected. That's a lot of stuff. I think we have a better shot at proving that Jesus existed than we do at proving I existed. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so the idea that we would just, oh, well, well, our starting point is we can't rely on the Bible. My question is, why not? And one of the authors of one of those Gospels, Luke, the physician who wrote the Gospel of Luke, also wrote Acts of the Apostle. It's one of the greatest historians of ancient times. So I think we can quite reasonably look to the Bible uh, and be secure that Jesus actually existed. Now, that's not the only evidence. But our scripture reading today from the New Testament also comes from the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, starting with the first verse. He says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you were saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you might believe in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, also as one out of them. Now, if the Bible were the only evidence that Jesus existed, I can see people, you know, you look for corroborating evidence. And especially if you find if you're doing historical research and you find something really interesting. You've got to be a little careful that you look for, well, did somebody else record the same thing? So we can also look to see, did anybody else in the first century write about Jesus other than, uh, uh, other than the New Testament writers? What well, turns out they did. And the person that we are most beholden to was a Jewish aristocrat named Flavius Josephus. Now Josephus is famous because he was a general on both sides during the first Jewish revolt. So he started out being a general for the Jewish uh, people who revolted. And then when the Roman legion showed up and they surrounded him, he actually surrendered and then he went over to their side. So there was no one better suited to write a history of the first Jewish uh, revolt than Flavius Josephus because he fought on both sides. So he, he would have lots of insight. Well, uh, in his later life, the Romans were so happy that he had uh, deserted to their cause that they gave him a villa and he wrote two big books. And one was called The Jewish War and one was called Jewish Antiquities, which was kind of a history of the Jews. And he actually mentions John the Baptist, James the Just, the brother of Jesus, and Christ, and all three of them are mentioned in his Jewish antiquities. Uh, the John the Baptist ones, uh, I, I'm not going to read the actual text, uh, but I do have a bulleted list of what the, the text included. It says John, the Baptist, John was called the Baptist. He commanded Jews to exercise virtue, both as to righteousness towards one another and piety towards God, and so to come to baptism. He baptized with water for remission of sin. He was put to death by Herod Antipas, who feared John would incite the people to rebellion. Guess what? That exactly aligns with the biblical account. Jesus is mentioned twice by Josephus. The first time is in reference to his brother, uh, James the Just, and uh, who's also the one with the bow box in Jerusalem, and the Osirah. Uh, and again, there are some pretty exciting parallels that we can find between what Josephus wrote and what's in the Bible. And by the way, Jesus, Josephus was not a Christian. He was a card-carrying Jew. Never met Jesus. He would have no reason to pass on the story unless it was true. So some of the parallels with the Gospel. Uh, and then, uh, Ananus, a Sadducee, was high priest of the Sanhedrin. He was very rigid in judging offenders. <laughs> Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now notice, he doesn't say Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah, but he does say he's called Christ or the Messiah. He talks about James, as, uh, the, the, the brother of Jesus, whose name was James. <coughs> so just like the bone box, 
Josephus identifies James by his more well-known brother. And James, accused before the Sanhedrin, was delivered to be stoned. But the big one, the big passage from Josephus that verifies Jesus' very existence, if you're going to start out without the Bible, which is what some people want you to do, is called the Testimonies. And it's in the 18th book of Jewish antiquities. And this one I think I will actually read, uh, since it's the big one. Now there was about this time Jesus a wise man, if it be called lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ, or the Messiah. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst them, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. And a tribe of Christians so named after him are not extinct at this day. I love that. The tribe of Christians are not extinct to this day. So what does this tell us about Jesus if we go just by Josephus? Jesus lived, bought into atheists, Jesus lived. He was a teacher and miracle worker. He had followers both among the Jews and the Gentiles. He was condemned to the cross by Pontius Pilate. His followers didn't stop following him even after the crucifixion. And a tribe of Christians found in Jesus' name still existed at the time of the writing of Jewish antiquities. Well, if you take all that stuff together from our friend Flavius Josephus, that pretty much sums up the biographical sketch of Jesus Christ. And no major historian has ever written that much about me. No major historian has ever written that much about any of you. Now, some of you were young enough that didn't may happen. Some of you. Uh, President Charlotte, I don't know. But so far, no major historian has written that much about any of us. So, is Josephus the only because, well, remember, if, if you're an atheist or you're a denigrator of Christianity, your starting point is don't pay attention to the Bible. And so then, after you're hit with Josephus, you say, yeah, but is there anybody other than Josephus? Well, it turns out there is. Talus, a first century historian, Phlegon, unfortunate name, Phlegon, <laughs> wrote Chronicles at 140. Pliny the Younger, not to be confused with Pliny the Elder was governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor. Cornelius Tacitus, a Roman senator and author of Annual Annals in 116 AD. Suetonius, another Roman historian. And Mar Bar Serapion, a Syrian prisoner of the Romans, all referred to Jesus or his followers during that first and early second century. So if we just look at the textual evidence or the documentary evidence, yeah, I think there's a pretty good backing that Jesus actually existed. Certainly there's as much backing that Jesus existed as there is that Julius Caesar existed. Prove Julius Caesar existed. Or here's an even better one. Prove that Homer, and I'm talking about the guy who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, not Homer Simpson. Uh, prove that Homer existed. Or give me some biographical detail about Homer who wrote the Iliad and Odyssey. Guess what? There is none. But does anybody suggest that Homer didn't exist? There's far more biographical evidence about Jesus than there is Homer. But nobody ever questions that Homer existed. So, uh, these sort of attacks have sort of dropped off a little in recent years. Uh, and now, uh, the more popular thing today, if you're trying to denigrate the validity of Christianity, is to say, well, yeah, Jesus existed, but he didn't say all that stuff, all that red letter stuff that's in the New Testament. He didn't actually say all this stuff. And there was this, a group called the Jesus Seminar. About 15 years ago, they all got together. They were very earnest. And they had colored beads. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. They had colored beads. And they went through the, all the red letter stuff in the Bible. And they voted using the color beads as to whether Jesus actually said that passage. And I forget what the colors represented, but one was, yeah, he definitely said it. And one was, 
maybe he said it. And the other was, nah, he didn't say it. And they voted with colored beads, and then they published their results to an eagerly waiting secular world. Thank you.